22 years ago, I walked into a bar and noticed a handsome guy making a beeline across the room in my direction. Aren't you Martha Carlin from Kentucky? I'm John Carlin, remember me? We had dated briefly in college. Everyone else in the room disappeared as his eyes drew me in. Eye contact and body language are universal signs of attraction. You know that spark, you've seen it. We moved to a nearby park and sat talking until 4 a.m. This 37-year-old man leaned in and boyishly asked me if he could kiss me. I knew before the sun rose that I would marry him, and I did. December 22nd, 1995. Life settled into that rhythm where things happen just as you hope they will. Until in 2002, I noticed something subtle, maybe only a wife would see. That look that captured my heart from across a crowded room was not the same. It was as if he was looking through me. My intuition led me to pick up a book by Michael J. Fox, Lucky Man, which described the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. As it turns out, pupil dilation is significantly blunted in Parkinson's. That faraway look was just that. On November 2nd, 2002, my 44-year-old husband was officially diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. It's a devastating diagnosis for a young couple with small children. But I'm not one to dwell on problems. Parkinson's is extremely complicated, but it's best described as the collapse of the body's ecosystem. Your body's systems stop working together as they should. Your senses dull as your autonomic nervous system slowly shuts down. You lose fine motor skills, have difficulty walking and talking. Your memory and thinking get cloudy. For a disease with so many critical symptoms, there can be no silver bullet cure. Prior to John's diagnosis, my 20-year business career was focused on running large, complex companies. I think in systems. I'm a serious turnaround expert. And I thought, why can't I turn Parkinson's around too? And so began my journey as a scientist. Not a PhD kind of scientist, a citizen scientist. My scientific journey is deeply personal. As kids, we're all scientists, looking at the world, asking questions and making connections. Why do we stop? We learn too soon that only the experts can know. But that's not true. My first discovery was that our approach to science and medicine is often too narrow. These fields have become so specialized that few people can keep up with their own colleagues, let alone those in other disciplines. We often fail to examine the interconnected whole. It's like standing too close to a painting and seeing only your favorite color. For 15 years, I studied the many fields of science I would need to understand the whole systemic problem of Parkinson's disease. Then I carefully pieced together this knowledge and connected it to my observations of my husband's state of health and his life history. I built my hypothesis on some of the best scientific information available and vetted my findings with some of the best researchers in the world. So what are the tools of a citizen scientist? PubMed search, and thousands of critical research papers. But you can't read those without a library and a good friend who's a college librarian. Amazon Prime, I read hundreds of books each year. Twitter for finding scientists around the globe. Even Google if you know how to use it. You need some disposable income and a lot less sleep. Through the use of these tools, 
I identified key pieces of the puzzle and attracted collaborative researchers. The famous scientist Louis Pasteur said, chance favors only the prepared mind. In December 2014, my mind was prepared and favored when Dr. Philip Shepperhans of Helsinki University published a paper correlating the dominant symptoms in Parkinson's disease to the presence or absence of specific gut bacteria. This was my eureka moment. Could this really be true? Dr. Shepperhan's microbiome theory brought the picture into focus in a way that nothing else had. Scientists call the microbial populations in and on our bodies the microbiome. There are nearly 50 trillion bacteria in our bodies, and they function as our internal pharmacy to maintain our health. They can chelate heavy metals and remove toxins from our bodies. They produce vitamins, hormones, and neurotransmitters, and act as sentinels at the gate when things are in balance. As I interviewed John and others in his Parkinson's support group, I noticed similar patterns in their histories. Chronic strep and other infections, repeated antibiotics, cold sores, shingles, exposures to pesticides and chemicals, diets high in sugar, and near constant low-grade stress. The 15-year mind map of my study connected to the microbiome in almost every node. I needed to test my theory. So I expanded on the work of Dr. Shepperhans by funding a project at the University of Chicago with the microbial ecologist, Dr. Jack Gilbert. Basically, we went through my husband's poop <laughs> with a fine-tooth comb. Dr. Gilbert encouraged me as I pushed at the edges of the research. Every night, I poured through the microbial research papers, going back to build my basic understanding and forward to read the papers flooding in through my Google Alerts on a daily basis. It made perfect sense. All of these microbes have been in and on our bodies since the beginning of time. So how could they not? have a profound impact. The key to unlocking the trends of chronic disease could very well be in our poop. There are over 10,000 diseases known in the world, and we are only treating a few. The numbers speak for themselves, rising exponentially in just two decades. Research is accelerating. And the data is already showing missing microbes from cesarean births, massive overuse of antibiotics in food and medicine, hormones created by stress, processed food, and chemicals in our environment are impacting our internal ecosystem in ways we are just beginning to understand. Poop can tell us a lot, but it can't give us the answers outside of our life stories. What you flush down the toilet every day has more than 350 times the information of the entire human genome. And it can fuel research exponentially, just like the genome did. What you flush down the toilet is already saving lives. You call it waste, I call it hope. And it just might save John and someone you love, too. So I hope to inspire all of you to think in a broader context, to paint together on the canvas, so that we may finally see the full picture that before us is hidden in our many separate dots. <laughs>